Hi, everybody. Welcome to your 13 Colonies Economy and Government Read Aloud. Uh, I'm going to say right off the bat here, I apologize. I do not have my best microphone, but hopefully you can hear this okay. Uh, before we get started, just want to look at that title, 13 Colonies Economy and Government. Economy means how people make money. So this reading is going to look at the different ways that people made money in the 13 colonies, and it's going to look at how uh, the government worked in these 13 English colonies, which eventually are going to become the United States of America. So let's take a look at our first question here. We're going to be looking for what was the, gr the largest seaport in the colonies. And we'll read until we find the answer to that question. So we'll start right at the beginning here. Setting the scene. Philadelphia bustled with activity in 1750. Young farmers drove cattle pigs, and sheep to market along narrow cobblestone streets. On the docks, sailors unloaded barrels of molasses from the West Indies, wines from Spain and Portugal, Dutch and English cloth, as well as spices, leather goods, tea, and coffee. Philadelphia was the largest and busiest seaport in the colonies. Yet by the 1700s, trade flourished all along the Atlantic coast. As trade increased, England began to take a new interest in its colonies. So I think we found the answer to that first question, didn't we? And we're going to highlight Philadelphia was the largest seaport in these 13 colonies. And let's be sure to number as well. We'll add a little text box there and number that question one. Okay, we can mark that off here. And we'll next we'll be looking for, uh, we're going to have probably several questions in a row here. According to mercantilism, what should nations do to become strong? Now, you probably don't know what mercantilism is, but the reading's going to tell you. Did mercantilists think countries should have more exports or more imports? And what are exports and imports? So we'll move on to the next paragraph. England regulates trade. Regulates means to control something. Like other European nations at the time, England believed that colonies existed for the benefit of the home country. This belief was part of an economic theory known as mercantilism. So uh, the question was, what is mercantilism? Well, it's an economic theory and it said that the colonies existed for the benefit of the home country. I can probably just highlight this whole section here and add a text box. So a theory is an idea. And the idea back then was if you had colonies, the whole point of having colonies was to make money for you. According to this theory, a nation became strong by building up its gold supply and expanding trade. And I think that is the question answer to the next question. Um, according to mercantilism, what should nations do to become strong? Well, look at that. I was wrong here. That was not the answer to question number two. Uh, so let's actually, let's leave that since you've probably already highlighted that information. Uh, I think it's a good fact to highlight because it shows what mercantilism was. But we really need to highlight this. A nation became strong by building up its gold supply and expanding its trade. So why don't we just leave all of this highlighted for question two? Uh, that's not a problem. Let's see if we can move that text box down here. There we go. Okay, so next question. Did mercantilists think countries should have more exports or more imports? And what are exports and imports? Because exports help a country earn money, mercantilists thought that a country should export more than it imports. Imports are goods brought into a country. So those are things that people in your country are buying. They're buying them from other countries, and those, those goods are coming into your country. Exports are goods sent to markets outside a country. So I'll talk about this in class, but another way to think of it is Imports are things that you buy, and exports are things that you sell. 
So let's add a text box there. That's definitely an answer to question three. And we'll move on to question. Oh, that's all, that's an answer to question three and question four. So we can just put three and four there. And now we're going to be looking for what part of the English government passed the Navigation Acts and what did these laws say about goods being shipped to and from the colonies? Beginning in the 1650s, the English Parliament passed a series of Navigation Acts that regulated trade between England and its colonies. The purpose of these laws was to ensure that only England benefited from colonial trade. So there we go. Uh, Parliament, we'll talk more about Parliament in class, is the one who passed these navigation acts. Navigation acts. Let's add our text box. And we'll continue there. Under the new laws, only colonial or English ships could carry goods to and from the colonies. And this is the answer to question six. So England was basically telling the people living in the colonies, you can only buy and sell stuff from us. At least you can only buy certain stuff from us. Be like telling someone, if you want to buy sneakers, you have to buy them at Walmart. Can't go to Target. Uh, we want Walmart to make money. And in this case, England is like Walmart and they're telling everyone, you have to buy your stuff from us. Let's double check that. Um, yep, I think we have the answer to question five and the answer to question six. And it asked, what were two products that could only be shipped to England? I don't think we've found that yet. Uh, but we're about to. The Navigation Acts also listed certain products such as tobacco and cotton that colonial merchants could ship only to England. In this way, Parliament created jobs for English workers who cut and rolled tobacco or spun cotton into cloth. So that is the answer to question seven. I think I'm going to put it over right over here. Okay, the next question is going to ask, why did many colonists resent or dislike the Navigation Acts? The Navigation Acts helped the colonies as well as England. For example, the law encouraged colonists to build their own ships. As a result, New England became a prosperous shipbuilding center. Also, because of the acts, colonial merchants did not have to compete with foreign merchants because they were sure of having a market for their goods in England. Now, that's very complicated. Uh, I'll take a minute to explain that. So the idea here is that England is telling the colonists, you have to buy and sell stuff with us. You can't buy and sell certain things with other countries. But that kind of helps people in the colonies because it means that there's always going to be someone who wants to buy their stuff. And that someone is England. Still, many colonists resented the Navigation Acts. In their view, the laws favored English merchants. Colonial merchants often ignored the Navigation Acts or found ways to get around them. So that is your answer. Why did they resent them? Because they, they felt that it unfairly helped English merchants. I mean, maybe it helped them a little bit, but they didn't think it helped them that much. And for the most part, they felt like it was helping business people back in England. Okay, I was just checking. That was question eight. So we're going to make our text box. And there we go. Label that question eight. Okay, I think we're going to read quite a bit before we find the answer to question nine. What was brought to the West Indies on the third and final leg of the triangle trade? Okay, and this next section is titled Trading in Rum and Slaves. The colonies produced a wide variety of goods, 
and ships moved up and down the Atlantic coast in an active trade. Merchants from New England dominated colonial trade. They were known as Yankees, a nickname that implied they were clever and hardworking. Yankee traders earned a reputation for profiting from any deal. Colonial merchants developed many trade routes. One route was known as the triangular trade because the three legs of the route formed a triangle. On the first leg, ships from New England carried fish, lumber, and other goods to the West Indies. There, Yankee traders bought sugar and molasses, a dark brown syrup made from sugar cane. The ships then sailed back to New England, where colonists used the molasses and sugar to make rum. On the second leg of the journey, ships carried rum, guns, gunpowder, cloth, and tools from New England to West Africa. In Africa, merchants traded these goods for slaves. On the final leg, ships carried enslaved Africans to the West Indies. With the profits from selling the enslaved Africans, traders bought more molasses. So we are going to highlight the answer there is on the final leg, the third leg, ships carried enslaved African people to the West Indies. So this is where slavery begins in the United States with this thing called the triangular trade. Uh, we are on question nine. Okay, so we need to label that nine. And we'll check here. We're going to be looking for what did New Englanders do when they couldn't get enough molasses from the English colonies in the West Indies? Many New England merchants grew wealthy from the triangular trade. In doing so, they often disobeyed the Navigation Acts. Traders were supposed to buy sugar and molasses only from English colonies in the West Indies. However, the demand for molasses was so high that New Englanders smuggled in cargoes from the Dutch, French, and Spanish West Indies too. Bribes made customs officials look the other way. So the answer there is going to be that they smuggled, New Englanders smuggled, which means like to secretly carry uh, or transport goods that you're not supposed to be carrying. It's basically breaking the law. In this case, it's breaking the navigation laws. So let's label that. And okay, we're gonna be on the second page here and we will be looking for, cross off question 10 there. What did the governor of a colony do, and what part of the colonial government made laws? Next section, colonial governors. Although each colony developed its own government, the governments had much in common. A governor directed the colony's affairs and enforced the laws. Most governors were appointed either by the king or by the colony's proprietor. In Rhode Island and Connecticut, however, colonists elected their own governors. So this is kind of like being a president. It's like you're a president of a colony. But in most cases, this president, this governor, was not elected in most colonies. They were appointed by the king. So that's the answer to question 11. What did the governor of a colony do? We'll now be looking for what part of the colonial government made laws and three things that the assembly did. So next section is titled Elected Assemblies. Each colony also had a legislature. A legislature is a group of people who have the power to make laws. In most colonies, the legislature had an upper house and a lower house. The upper house was made up of advisors appointed by the governor. So the legislature is the part of the colonial government that makes the laws. And I have a special way for you to remember that, but you're going to have to wait until class to find out. The lower house was an elected assembly. It approved laws and protected the rights of citizens. 
just as important, it had the right to approve any taxes the governor asked for. So that looks like one, two, three things that the assembly did. It approved laws, it protected people's rights, and it had to approve of any taxes that the, the governor tried to make. So that is, let's check. I think I got the numbers right. Is that question 12 and 13? Yes, it is. So we're now looking for who was allowed to vote in the colonies. Uh, oh, well, we didn't finish that section, so let's finish this here. This power of the purse, or right to raise or spend money, was an important check on the governor's power. Any governor who ignored the assembly risked losing his salary, which is his pay. Colonial rights. Each colony had its own rules about who could vote. By the 1720s, however, all the colonies had laws that restricted the right to vote to white Christian men over the age of 21. In some colonies, only Protestants or members of a particular church could vote. All voters had to own property. Colonial leaders believed that only property owners knew what was best for the colony. So there's a, there's a lot here. Uh, for who could vote. Uh, in fact, it actually seems like it's more who couldn't vote, right? So I'm just going to highlight this whole section here for question 14. It's a bit of a complicated uh, answer to that question, who could vote. It really depended. Uh, let's see. What was a Bill of Rights and what did the English Bill of Rights do? We've got three more questions left. Colonists took great pride in their elected assemblies. They also valued the English Bill of Rights. A Bill of Rights is a written list of freedoms the government promises to protect. So there's our definition of Bill of Rights. The English Bill of Rights protected the rights of individuals and gave anyone accused of a crime the right to a trial by jury. Just as important, the English Bill of Rights said that a ruler could not raise taxes or an army without the approval of Parliament. I think we're highlighting this whole section here, which explains what the English Bill of Rights, uh, what it did. And I think you can see from uh, what you highlighted that the English Bill of Rights was very important to the people in the 13 colonies. All right, and we're going to add another text box there because that is question... 15 and 16, I'm pretty sure. Yep, and we have one more question. What groups of people in the colonies had their rights restricted or limited? And we'll go right to the top here. Ready to finish? I am. Still, the rights of English citizens did not extend to everyone in the colonies. Women had more rights in the colonies than in Europe, but far fewer rights than did free white men. A woman's father or husband was supposed to protect her. A married woman could not start her own business or sign a contract unless her husband approved it. Africans and Native Americans in the colonies had almost no rights. Sadly, slavery existed side by side with the English liberties so many colonists held dear. The conflict between liberty and slavery would not be resolved until the 1860s. Okay, so that is the final question, guys. Thank you. This is sort of a long, complicated reading. So a lot of really big ideas here uh, and maybe some things that uh, are unfamiliar to you, some of these terms like imports and exports and legislature. But, hey, we're here to learn. Thanks for joining me. You guys did a great job, and I will see you next time.